Hello everyone, I'm Tina Seelig, Faculty Director of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, and I'd like to welcome you to our special edition of our ETL Thought Leaders Revisited, presented by the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, which is the Entrepreneurship Center at Stanford School of Engineering. Today, we are completely delighted to welcome Mayor Michael Tubbs back to ETL. A little background on November 8th, 2016, Michael Tubbs was elected to serve as the mayor of the city of Stockton. And upon taking office in January 2017, he became Stockton's youngest and the first city's first African American mayor. In fact, Michael Tubbs is also the youngest mayor in the history of the country, representing a city with a population of more than 100,000 residents. Super impressive. In his first year as mayor, Michael Tubbs secured a $20 million to launch Stockton Scholars, which is a scholarship program that aims to triple the number of Stockton students entering and graduating from college. He also brought Advance Peace to Stockton, which is a data-driven program that works to reduce gun violence in communities. And he also launched an incredibly impressive program, the public-private partnership with a seed money of a million dollars to launch the nation's first ever mayor-led guaranteed income pilot. So this was super exciting. Before being mayor, Michael Tubbs served as Stockton's District 6 City Council person, and he earned his bachelor's degree at Stanford and received his master's degree in policy, organization, and leadership studies at Stanford's Graduate School of Education. Well, that is a mouthful, Michael. Welcome back to ETL. Thank you so much for having me. So good to see you. It's so great. Now, first, I want to uh, wish you a 30, a happy 30th birthday. I know you had a birthday just recently, and I must say you have done more in your 20s than most people have done in a lifetime. So in this talk, we're going to do something special. We're going to both reflect upon your visit back four years ago when you came to Stanford and look to the future of what you're thinking about now. So we're going to play some short clips along the way and uh, highlight some of the remarkable work that you're doing as Stockton's mayor. So I'd like to go back, take the Wayback Machine and start with a clip uh, where you really uh, talk about listening to your users and extreme users in your community to really understand what the real needs are. So let's start with clip number one. But we started with what I learned at the D school to be known as extreme users. We started in one of the poorest housing developments in the city, probably not with a lot of voters. And we spent two weeks just knocking on every door there, talking to them about their hopes, their aspirations, and what they wanted for the city. But it was in talking to this extreme user group, the group that wasn't on our nation builder files that won't show up on voter registration rolls, that we found our campaign message. It was really one about moving the city forward and that many communities had felt bankrupt for a long time that the city's financial bankruptcy was only a symptom of a deeper bankruptcy in leadership, a moral bankruptcy, and a bankruptcy of vision. And that's what we ran on. So everyone was talking about the fiscal constraints and bankruptcy, really important topics. But for voters, they wanted to talk about what's the vision for Stockton. Well, that was super impressive, OK? Even back then, you were really using what you learned in school to figure out how could you address the real needs of the community. So, are the extreme users that you're talking to now in your community to help shape the policies that you're putting in place? Well, wow, I, I probably should have watched my talk before this one, um, but that was that was um, great to see. And I think a lot of that work has continued over um, while in my term as mayor. So to answer your question, the extreme users we're listening to now are a um, residents who are homeless. And you figured out sort of a sustainable solution to deal with the homelessness issue. That's a crisis in Stockton as it is in much of the state of California. Um, the other user group we've been listening to a lot are the guys most likely to be victims or perpetrators of violent crime. Um, we spend a lot of time listening and meeting with them and do so about once a quarter. Um, and then for the basic income pilot, we listen to sort of Stocktonians who are one paycheck away. Um, for a one five hundred dollar emergency away from really financial ruin, and I think, and again, it's, it's so refreshing seeing that clip because I think more so just a speech has really become embedded in how I and my team try to make policies, particularly around kind of big ideas. It really starts with listening and figuring out sort of who are we 
design set policy for and what exactly are the needs that we're trying to meet. Yeah, it's super impressive. I mean, it's funny in four years to think how much you were able to accomplish. Now, you mentioned the basic income program that you put in place. I know that's been such a revolutionary project that a lot of people are looking to stock them to get some insights. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Some people might not be as familiar. So one of the first things I did as mayor was identifying the issue of poverty and economic insecurity being kind of intersectional and the crux of a lot of issues we're facing in the city. So I learned about basic income through studying Dr. King at Stanford. He talked about this before he was murdered. And we decided to do a pilot called SEED, Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration. And I know Stanford students love to research. If you go to StocktonDemonstration.org, you can see all the data. But essentially for 18 months, um, we have just extended it for another six. We were able to give 125 randomly selected families that look like our city $500 a month. And what we found is that $500 is not enough to replace work or to make people stop working or to make Stockton, not part of the United States of America, <laughs> but it has been enough to make work pay, to provide an income floor and to provide peace of mind and the ability for people to take risks. Uh, one of my favorite stories is from uh, one recipient named Tomas, who told me that with his first $500, he went in an interview. And at first I was dismayed when he told me that, but like you're feeding to all these stereotypes, like why would you pay money to be interviewed, Tomas? That makes no sense. And he said, no, Mayor, I work hourly, which means I don't have paid time off, which means if I take time off to interview, that's $200 on my pocket and we live paycheck to paycheck. I can't take that risk. But with the $500, I was able to be entrepreneurial. I was able to take time off work, take a risk better on myself. And now I have a better job with more benefits, less hours. I'm able to do more with my kids. And stories like that have been so inspiring to me and I think again particularly during this time with COVID-19 and people unable to work or people being told if you're coughing or have a fever don't work but also being told you have to pay your bills and, and don't have paid time off again or wages have an increase with inflation that I'm just more resolute than ever that we have to have some sort of a guaranteed income and income floor if not for everyone for the vast majority of people to allow people to build a resilience but also to allow people to be entrepreneurs in their lives to make decisions about what to, do, to, to pay for the car note, to pay for tutoring, to, to start that business. So but it started with sort of a deep design session for a year with community groups listening. And that's what made me a believer, Tina, is realizing that no folks know how to spend money. Like I, could, I could trust the people who I trusted to vote for me to know how to spend money, but a lot of it again came from listening and sitting with people in their environments and hearing them tell me how they would use $500 before we even disperse any money. So how did you pick $500? And how did you pick 18 months? Like what were the, what were the reasons and the ways that you scoped this project? I mean, we have, we have real researchers who are PhDs who, had, who had some rigorous analysis, but from my layman's vantage point, we were able to get a million dollar grant um, and we just did the math and we said, okay, well, we could do a thousand, we did $2,000, $1,000, $500. And what we found was $500 was enough to get us to a longer period of time, 18 months, where there's some more rigorous um, conclusions could be drawn from the data because of the length of time. Um, we sell on $500 a month because one in two Americans can afford one $500 emergency. So I never just felt right. And it, and it felt too big. It felt like $500. That, it's a lot, but it's not too big. And then number three, I, I literally sat in the back of the envelope and added up my internet bill, my light bill, my water bill, my trash bill. And it was about $500. So I was like, well, look, this is a good amount that will pay for a lot of, the, a lot of bills for people. Um, and, and so... So we sell on $500, which I think is great because we're showing that if $500 is beneficial, then that's the floor. And anything more would be better. But at the very least, we know $500 would still matter for a lot of people. Yeah, super interesting. So you ran it for 18 months, right? And then did it stop? No, so it was supposed to stop in July, but then in March, COVID happened. And we were hearing from recipients and others about how they were waiting for unemployment insurance, which 
they qualified for, which they paid into, which they still haven't received. And their bills kept coming and that the $500 was their lifeline. It was the only thing that was keeping them afloat, which was very scary for me as a mayor of 300,000 plus people. Um, Cause I like, well, where are these people in the basic income program are fine, but what about the 300,000 other people I represented? How are they making it? Um, and then folks were saying that they needed the $500 because they're forced to quarantine, they're forced to stay home. They're not driving Uber anymore. They're, they've been laid off. Their kids are home more now, so they spend more on food. It became very apparent that we had, it would be inhumane to, to stop the program in the midst of a pandemic. So we're able to extend the program to January, which I think is important because we're able to do research around how basic income is not just, in, it's particularly important in times of crisis. That as a pandemic response, as a way to build national resilience, Economic security has to be a part of that. And now we'll have the next nine months to, to illustrate that. Um, so we're gonna to continue to January. And then at the same token, two months ago, I started a group called Mayors for Guaranteed Income, which includes 20 mayors, including the mayor of Atlanta, the mayor of LA, the mayor of Oakland, the mayor of St. Paul, et cetera, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, New Orleans, who are all saying that we need a national guaranteed income during this time. And they're all going to do pilots like we've done in Stockton, um, particularly because COVID-19 has just made it very clear that we have to make sure that people have the tools for the basics at least. Well, it's so interesting because um, I, I want to play the next clip, which is very closely aligned to this, where you talk about the relationship between profits and policy. And you know, should you let profits drive policy or do you make a policy that then you figure out, okay, here's a policy, but now we're gonna to have to figure out how to fund it and make it work. So let's watch the second clip and then talk about how you sort of tried to turn this around. I'm extremely worried about my, my kid asking me one day, like why dad in a time with all these technological advancements and all this good stuff, people figuring out how to live on Mars and on the moon, and you guys had a black president, but people still had to go to the streets and tell people that black lives matter. I, I'm, I'm worried, I'm, I'm really, frankly, afraid about what happens when we let profit determine policy. And I think we've seen some of that with the private prison industry, where literally private prison corporations have helped write the country's criminal justice policies for the past 20 years. I, I'm worried that, that we'll spend all our time and all our energy and all our smart on, on making cool products, but really forgetting about people. Okay, so you, you, know, you have been totally consistent here and in the way that you have been approaching your role. So how do you do this? I mean, how do you think about the role of financial support for the types of policies that you're trying to implement? Yeah, well, I think part of it, Tina, is understanding that profit in and of itself isn't bad. The idea of making money and doing well isn't a bad idea. What is bad is if that becomes the overriding rationale for policy. Like my job as a policymaker isn't just to make some people money. <laughs> my job as a policymaker is to create the conditions where everyone can do well. And I think even now as mayor, I understand that so much more now that folks who have influence and folks who have access are able to influence policy in a way that not only drives profit, but also hurts people and also doesn't allow other people to enjoy some, some of the growth. So and I'm not sure I'm answering your question. So what was the question again? Yeah, well, just thinking about how, what drives, you know, how do you figure out what policies you want, and then how do you figure out how to support them, right? These things are very expensive, universal basic income. Yeah. In fact, I, I yeah. want to underline that because, you know, one of the questions that a lot of the listeners are, are asking about is, how do you come up with the idea for universal basic income, and how did you even get support? So it's a perfect example, like here's a big idea, how do you then garner support for something that feels so radical and expensive? Got it. No, I think for me, I, for most things we look at as a team, uh, if, is the status quo untenable? That's our first question. Like, can we not live if this doesn't change? Will we feel like we failed if this doesn't change? And if the answer is yes, that gives us the courage, the energy, the moxie to move forward with, okay, then how do we find a solution 
that at its very worst is a little bit better than the status quo. So we're making progress. So that's kind of the, the decision-making matrix. And then once that happens, I was lucky enough on the basic income front to meet the economic security project on one of the co-chairs, Dally Foster, at an event for Tech for America in San Francisco. And we talked about how they had a desire to do a pilot for basic income. At the same time, I had my staff researching tools to eradicate poverty and basic income rose to the top. So we're able in that way to do a public-private partnership. And I tell you all the time, public-private partnerships are great to test ideas because to your points about taxpayer dollars, even though we waste a lot of them on crazy things like space wars and things of that sort, they're still a finite resource. And we still should be as good stewards, mindful of how we're spending money. Um, so public-private partnerships are helpful to test ideas. And that's what we did with the basic income program. 18 months, we tested all philanthropically funded. And now with this group of mayors, mayors for guaranteed income, we're advocating for taxpayer funds. We're saying, okay, the idea has been tested. Now we have to scale it because charity, as I think I said in, in that speech, charity is injustice, programs aren't policy, and we have to incubate ideas. But then when we know it works, then we have to scale it. So to answer your question, part of it just comes from understanding how expensive the cost of inaction is, that if we don't do anything, how much will we continue to pay? And also just the idea that the status quo in many cases, or in some cases, just is not sustainable, it doesn't work. And as leaders, we are called to address those issues. And you can't do that with everything, but there's one, two, three, four, five issues where you absolutely have to, at least to create this society that I would argue that we all deserve to live in. I think it's a really good point is that doing nothing is expensive, right? I mean, if you're, if you're in a situation where things are really not working, it becomes very expensive to be, um, to be inactive. So there's a, a question that a lot of people are, are curious about. You know, politics is very divisive right now. What is your approach to building coalitions to get meaningful things done? Yeah, I think... Um... And Stockton, I'm lucky in a sense because my council is four Republicans and two Democrats. And I have to get four votes to get anything done. So anything we voted on, I've had to work with both Republicans and Democrats. And some of the most influential people in the business community, in my community, are Republican. Um, so I think part of it is just understanding that you have to work together. <laughs> that as someone who's a pragmatist at heart who likes to get things done, I understand I have to work with people I may not agree about on the hundred issues. If I agree with you on this issue, I will work with you and congratulate you and amplify you for your great work on this issue while knowing we may have to fight about the issue tomorrow. So I think that's part of it. And I think for me, um, even though the policy is personal, the, the politics isn't, meaning that I am deeply impacted by like the work I do, it's personal. Um, and I try to be hard on policy, but soft on people. So I try to go drive hard on this, what we need to do is what we need to do. If we have to disagree about it, we'll disagree. If we have to have public rebuke, public rebuke. But then the next day, realize I might need to work with you. So the next day, say like, bygones be bygones. Let's figure out where we are. Can we agree on this issue? So I think that's part of it. I think part of it is also, especially at a local level, you could invest the time in relationship building. Because I think because of the diversity of Stockton, not just ethnically, but um, politically, I've learned so much about how my more conservative constituents and more conservative colleagues think about things or how they hear things. And I think it's maybe a more effective communicator, more effective messenger, and it's allowed me to consider issues from a different vantage point, which may not be my frame, even if I don't always agree with it. So I think it's been a useful kind of tool and skill, but underlying all this is this idea that I wanna get things done. <laughs> like things have to get done and you won't get anything important done just working with people who agree with you all the time. You'll do some things, but for the big things, you need to have a big tent of people who may not agree with you again on every issue, but you found some common ground on this one. I, I love this because it, although you didn't use the word empathy, you really talk about having incredible empathy for the people who have different points of view and I'm sure you learn a lot from them. So I, I wanted to just point out, we have a number of people who've written comments about just how they're big fans of yours. You know, one person said, I went to Stanford with you and I remember your commencement speech about growing up in Stockton and I'm so impressed with what you've done. Another person said, I went to Stockton, to high school in Stockton before you were born and to Stanford too. 
And uh, I'm, I'm just so impressed. And what, this person wants to know if you're running for re-election, which I think you are. Yes, I am running for re-election. I have 83 days to November. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you for all the people for the well wishes. Well wishes. It's so funny when I hear people say they were there for that convocation, I think, speech. That means you're four years younger than me, which makes me feel of some type of way. Um, but, no, but I appreciate it. Great. Well, um, I, let's go on to the next, uh, the next video clip. So I love this one a, a lot because when you started, you know, when you came, you, you were just beginning. You were just starting your political career. And you basically talk about the fact that you didn't have experience and you had to learn from other people and the importance of really being a good listener and asking a lot of questions. So let's play clip number three about this and then talk about you know, who you're listening to now. There's a lot of pressure to feel like you're the expert. But I realized that in not knowing everything has been so freeing because it's opened the door for me to connect with people who do have the answers. So it's been great to work on issues like poverty and realize that I have some Stanford experience and lived experience, but there are some subject matter experts who've been doing this work in this community for 25 years who may not have the degrees or the pedigree, but they know what they're talking about. And it's been so freeing to say, you guys, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. I know that someone knows. So help, let's find this answer collectively. So don't feel pressure to know all the answers or have all the answers, because part of, in my opinion, entrepreneurship and iteration is not knowing if what you're doing is going to work. It's the iteration, the experimentation that leads to knowledge. The knowledge is not already baked in. Right. So I'm curious, though, as you become an expert and get you know more experience, who do you continue to go to? And do you worry that if you go to people who've done it before, you're going to get the same old answers as opposed to something fresh and new? So how do you how do you gather new and fresh ideas? So generally, I, I try to go to the people who've been doing it, because even if I disagree or even if I want something new, for me, it's important to understand what's working in the status quo or why something's the way it is. Because I found that oftentimes, there may be a policy reason, an administrative reason, a grant report. There's a, oftentimes there's a reason, whether you agree with it or not, there's a reason for a certain behavior, a certain outcome. So I'm always curious for the people who are working, like, okay, why is it like this? Because that helps me create different solutions, which may look different than what I originally imagined. Um, and then number two, I think I, I still go to experts. So for example, I was just supported to the um, post commission for the state. So by, I'll, one of the 15 people who determine police standards for the state of California, the, when the, the first or second largest police force in this country. And I'm a mayor, but I've never went through police training. So I've had meetings with the community college chancellor who had overseas lobby training to hear sort of where his pain points are. I've talked with my police chief about what we'd like to see better. I've talked with residents of my community and I've also spent time with the Center for Policing Equity, the nation's experts on policing to understand from them sort of uh, what needs to be done. And from all those inputs and then from my own research, I come up with kind of, okay, so I want to advocate for it, so I want to push. And I think I try to do that on every issue. I'm usually once a week on a call with someone who's a subject matter expert, a policy person. Um, I'm Raj Chetty, who used to be at Stanford. I used to bug his office all the time, every time they issue a report, to understand sort of with your opportunity index, what does this mean for Stockton? How, how do I operationalize it? How do I do it? Um, so it's definitely still part and core of my governing philosophy is, because um, I think oftentimes leadership is not about being a subject matter expert. It's about kind of using values to guide priorities, resource allocation, and just decision making. But it doesn't mean you have to know everything. You have to know sort of kind of, you should be smart, be able to read and complete synthesis, but you don't have to be the expert on everything, but you should be the expert, like going to experts and people that understand what's happening on the ground and use their information and put it in conversation with sort of the values you have um, to kind of come to, to, to decisions and the benefit of all people in the community. I love the idea of being an expert on going to experts. So that's, that's, a, that's a great line to remember. So we have a number of students who are really curious about how, how do you prepare to go into a life in politics? That you know, they're saying, 
you know, what sort of skills and capabilities should they be developing if they aspire to go into a life of service like you? I think in terms of service, um, number one, it's about service, which sounds very basic, but um, Dr. King talked about using a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples about this idea of a drum major instinct that in, intrinsic in all human beings is this desire to be the drum major, to be first. And he was saying that, it, and he was using this when Jesus told Peter and Paul, I can't give you the left and the right, but the greatest of you should be the servant of all. And, and Dr. King interpreted that to mean that the drum major instinct in and of itself isn't bad, like the idea of wanting to be first or wanting to be important because it has to be connected to purpose. So be a drum major for justice, be a drum major for peace, be a drum major for something. So I think that's the most important thing is understand like, why do you want to run? What are you running for? And then what do you want to do? Because I think oftentimes people run with the idea of getting into office, but then when they get into office, they're unsure of what to do because they didn't really run to do something. They ran to be something. And we need more people who are running to do something. I love um, Because that. we have- enough. You know what? The, the wisdom that you're sharing is, is just wonderful. In fact, this next clip is one I think that is particularly powerful, especially for the students in the room. Um, and you talk about the fact that you didn't intend to run for office. This is not when you went to school, this was not your, and that it ended up resulting after you know some real big disappointments where the paths you thought you were gonna take got closed. And you know some opportunity that you basically said, you know what, I, I need to do this. So let's play this clip, the, the fourth clip, about how you know the pains you experienced actually unlocked the door to your passions. So I told my mom, you know what, mom? One day when I'm 30, 34, 38, 42, 50, I'll come back to Stockton and, and help out because the city really needs help. Um, but then my senior year, I was applying for fellowships and jobs and I didn't get what I thought was mine. I was an entitled Stanford student. I had good grades. I had worked hard. I had the best recs. I had the best resume. I thought for sure that was my job and my purpose in life to be a Rhodes Scholar. And that's just what was going to happen for me. So I put all my eggs in that basket and then it didn't work out for me. Um, so then I remember being so upset, so hurt. Like I thought I found my purpose. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. and now. I can't do it. And I, and I start with that because in, it was in all these valley experiences, all these low points, whether growing up in poverty or losing my cousin or not getting the fellowship that really clarified the path that I was going to take. This is super important. So, um, you know, the, the idea that the lowest lows helped you unlock your path. So what, what allowed you to actually get out of that low spot? you know, a lot of people hit bottom and it's super difficult to, to get out. What was it that allowed you to get unstuck uh, as opposed to becoming, you know, bitter and broken? Um, I think it's just my spiritual practice. And he's coming from a community of faith that speaks to sort of all things happen for a reason. And that even when bad things happen, part of the journey of being human is to unlock and, and try to understand what God, higher power, what wants you to understand and learn from this experience. So that was super helpful, just having a, a, a faith tradition that teaches that like everything's happening for a reason, even if it feels terrible. So just figuring out, okay, how can this be used for a greater good? Um, and then number two, I think is, is realizing that, as I think, as I said, like, rejection is just, it, it's just a redirection that this, this, you're doing everything right. If you know you've done your best, that maybe the no was a good thing. And maybe there's something else that's more in line in to what you should be doing. And the rejection was a way to get you there. Which is easier said than done. I mean, I wasn't happy. I was upset. <laughs> I was like, I felt like a failure. I felt dumb. Um, being a Rhodes Scholar felt a lot safer, a lot more conventional, a lot more like makes sense than like running for city council. So like even afterwards, the decision to run for council wasn't an easy one to make. It was, it was pretty scary, but and then you always look smarter looking back. Like looking back, it makes so much sense. But in that moment, if you just understand that rejection also isn't permanent um, and that no one lives life linearly. Like no one's life is one where everything happens the way you want it to happen or everything happens the way you think it will go. And that the best things happen actually when you're rejected, when you face some resilience, you have to figure out how to get through. When you look back, you're like, oh, wow, I'm so happy I was rejected. Wow. 
You know, I, I love, again, your line about rejection is really about a redirection and using thinking like, you know what, I'm probably, I'm not going to the right direction. Uh, that, that's a, a message assigned. So there are a lot of people who are pointing out, and this is very critically important, that we are living in a very unusual and very special moment in time where the nation is grappling with, you know, racism and inequality. And, you know, in your position as mayor, what do you recommend to aspiring students who really want to help build systems that are actively anti-racist and foster more a more equitable society? Um, hmm. Can you, so for students who want to Yeah, be, you know, people who say, I want to I wanna contribute to this. I want I want to make a meaningful contribution. This is something that um, I feel driven to make a powerful, help make powerful changes. Yeah, well, I think first of all, it's understanding that this is a marathon, not a sprint. I um, mean that we're talking about 400 years of a history that we're confronting with. It doesn't mean we have to be nihilistic and it doesn't mean we, have to, we don't need to push and demand, but it does mean we need to be realistic and understand that this, we have to take care of ourselves and have a strategy for the next 50, 60, 70, 100 years. Um, number two, I think with Stanford comes immense privilege. And I tell people all the time, don't apologize for your privilege, but put purpose to it. And a big way to put purpose to it is to allow other people who may have more experience, who may actually be very equipped to work on the issues you want to work on, a seat next to you at the table. I think one of the things I'm conscious of as mayor is making sure I bring as many people in with me to the table because I know that I'm able to get there because I went to Stanford, I'm the mayor, and they may not, although they're more impacted by what happens on this decision than I'll be because my privilege insulates me from a lot of the um, insidu insidious impacts of, of bad policy oftentimes. Um, number three, I would say be educated. Read, 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 learn, listen, so you're equipped. And number four, understand that no matter where you go, because what we're talking about in terms of racism, white supremacy, is, is, is ubiquitous. Meaning that it's not just in politics, it's not just in policing, it's in every institution in our country, which means when you're in the tech boardroom, when you're creating your startup, when you're like, no matter what you're doing, you have to actively make sure you're fighting against and not perpetuating um, the, the system you want to change. And then we also have to acknowledge that for some of us, um, there's real benefit to the current system. And to understand that in changing these systems, you may be giving yourself less privilege. You may be giving yourself less authority. You may be giving yourself less opportunity to drive the agenda. And be comfortable with that because that's part of this process is understanding that so many folks have been excluded, marginalized, meaning that if we bring more people in, you might not have as large a slice of the pie as you, as you may be used to, to enjoying, which isn't a bad thing. But I just want to be really realistic about this, what we're talking about. We're talking about bringing more people in, expanding opportunity and giving the ability to lead, the ability to be part of the conversation to folks who have traditionally been left out of marginalized, which means some of us have to shut up. Some of us have to be quiet. Some of us have to listen um, and leave that way. So that was really helpful. I mean, I think that we probably have to listen to that many times over and internalize all of those insights and recommendations. Um, this leads us actually to the final clip that I want to share is one where you talk about the difference between charity and justice and, and how important is I mean, when I hear this clip, I hear that charity is important, but that's in the short term. You really need to make some really systemic changes. So let's watch this clip and then talk about, you know, in this moment in time, what is the balance of need for charity and justice? Charity is what we do and it feels good and it's important, but justice is the hard work of surgery of what it takes to move the country forward. And, and, and then I also think that in terms of my own work that charity is me throwing resources at an issue and making the assumption that the problem is one of resources. If they had more of this, if they had more in that, if I give to them what I have, then that solves the problem. But, but, but justice is really about putting myself, my brain, my resources, my talent, my time, and my body 
and on the line in a way until we really get at a solution. And that's not sexy, that's not easy, that's incredibly difficult, but that's the only way we as a society will progress, in my humble opinion. Okay, so that is a strong statement. So um, what do you think about it? I mean, I, I'm sure you want people to donate and give money to the initiatives that you're running, right? That might feel like charity if you want me to write a check. Okay, so I think you want people to do that, but then justice is, is, is longer term. So can you talk a little bit about the balance between these two? Yeah, absolutely. I think charity is necessary, but not sufficient. That charity is important to do because as we work for these larger structural changes and ideals, we have to deal with the problems of today. So charity isn't a bad thing. I think charity becomes a bad thing when that's all we do. And the underlying conditions that gave rise to the need for charity aren't addressed. So I think like most things, I like to have my cake and eat it too. It's like a both ends. So I think charity is something that's necessary. And that's not, charity is not bad. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And charity is a great entree into justice work because in, in, in giving to charity or donating to charity or helping a charity, you're implicitly acknowledging that something's wrong, that I'm doing more than I should be doing, or I'm giving more because this is not right. So then the next step in terms of justice is to ask, why is it not right? And it's usually some underlying structure or policy reason um, that gives rise to the need for charity. And I think with that rigorous questioning and analysis, we can all hold ourselves more accountable to do charity, but to make sure our charity goes further. And the best way to make our charity goes further is that it's in, it's in, in service of justice. So that we understand we're giving dollars, we're giving resources, we're helping who we can, while at the same time pushing and advocating and voting in a way that brings us more aligned to, the, to a day where our charity is not needed anymore. Interesting. So this leads to you know, one of the questions uh, that's been asked by the students, which is, you know, they're studying entrepreneurship. And they're saying in ventures, we learn about business models and competitive strategies. How does this translate into, into politics? Like what's the business model that underpins the things that you're doing? And maybe is the business model a combination of charity and justice? How, how do you think about that? Yeah, I think like charity is like making payroll, but justice is the reserves. And particularly in the time we know that the economy goes like this. If you're just barely making payroll every quarter, you're not going to be a successful business long term. You're, you're not going to be able to pivot when things like COVID-19 happens. I think it's the same way for a society that we have to make sure at the very least we make payroll, but that's not enough. We can't invest in new technologies. We can't invest in new pivots. We cannot withstand storms if all we're doing is paying payroll. So I think Charity is payroll, but justice is, is the reserves necessary to be able to pivot, to be able to invest, to be able to research and to try and to iterate. And you can't do that if you're just barely paying people on um, their, their hourly rate, wages on their salaries. So um, there's a question about, uh, you know, especially in this very unusual time, are you seeing more community led as uh, sort of bottoms up change as well as tops down city led and, you know are you seeing more diversity in the types of groups that are getting involved with helping to make change in the community yeah i think that over the past four years particularly now people are saying that even though we like neurotypes he's our guy we have to also be part of the conversation on driving change and all the answers can't come from city hall or can't come from one person so during COVID-19, a lot of initiatives like Stockton Strong, which is a group of the community coming together to provide mutual assistance and information to each other. The San Joaquin United, which is a group talking about how to hold our county government accountable for delivering services to people during this time, um, has really reflected an idea that the community understands that they too have a role to play, but that they too have to lead and they too have to push. So um, absolutely, I've seen more um, community brand, community led leadership, and also very diverse uh, members of our community. There's this discussion when the groups had about women of color in Stockton and, le and leadership and highlighting their work and some of the barriers they face. So I'm actually proud of the way that's been progressing in the city. Great. Well, um, 
obviously great progress. Uh, there are a number of people who are very curious about your long-term political aspirations. I'm sure people ask you all the time, you know, do you aspire to higher office, governor, president? Uh, I think you're starting to get a uh, following here. So uh, what do you think about this or are you really rooted just in Stockton right now? So I, I definitely think about the future. Um, excited, I'm running for re-election. Um, but I think in 2024, I'll be termed out as mayor, and then there'll have to be a conversation with my wife about sort of if the sacrifices, if the amount of time and energy invested in the political world, is it worth it? Because there's a lot of ways to make a difference. I spend a lot of my time talking to philanthropists, for example. I spend a lot of my time meeting with organizers and advocates, for example. I spend a lot of my time talking to business people, for example, and they all have media people. They all have incredible influence in terms of shaping culture of bringing resources and providing opportunity. So to answer your question, I'm not sure long term what office or if any office I'll be in, but I know I'll continue to work on the issues I talked about four years ago and I'm still talking about now. And namely, how do we create an opportunity structure in this country that's reflected to what we say on paper, that we really believe that all people are created equal, that we actually do believe that everyone has inherent human dignity. And, and if that's in the government role, I'll do that. But if it's another role, I'll do that as well. So open to title, but very clear about vocation. Um, that's just to create a better opportunity structure in this country. Really, uh, thank you for, for that. The idea is it doesn't matter exactly the title, but you know, you're gonna be working on having an impact on your community. So um, I would like to sort of take the way back machine. You know, we looked four years ago, but let's go back to when you were a student. Uh, you know, what, oh, no. what do you wish you knew? It's not that long ago. What do you wish you knew when you were, you know, sitting in the classroom watching people give talks like this? And then let's flash forward a little bit. And then what do you wish you knew when you started in politics? You know, what sort of insights have you gained over those years that would have changed your trajectory in any way? I, I did a fairly good job of this, but I wish I had knew more explicitly just how much college was about the classes I took, but more importantly about the people I met and the relationships I formed and forged. Um, some of them, I met my wife at Stanford, um, met Evan Spiegel, one of my closest friends, who's been a great um, partner in the work in Stockton at Stanford. Um, met some of my best friends at Stanford, but I had no idea going in that the most important part of college would be building relationships with as many people as possible. Because in five, 10, 20, 30 years, these are the people who are gonna help shape the world, right? So I wish I, I think I did a fairly good job, but I wish I had spent just more time being intentional about spending time with people, not in a weird networking way, but in like, I just wanna build relationship with all the folks I can, because these are the people who are gonna help create the world um, that, that we'll live in. Um, in terms of my time as, and also I'm glad I was a nice person because I realized people have long memories. So to all the students watching and listening, treat everybody well. Um, you have no idea when you'll need somebody, when somebody will come up at a dinner conversation, when somebody will be a gatekeeper or where you, someone needs, to, someone has, it's a key to a connection and people remember how you treat them. So don't, don't, don't be work weird, don't be a jerk and treat everyone well. Um, in terms of the beginning of my political career, I wish I had learned that like change only moves at the speed of trust. So you can have the best ideas, but if you don't spend time in community building trust and rapport with people, it'll be very difficult to face opposition. And also the fact that even when you're doing well and doing things well, you have to go back and report to your people because what you're doing up here may not be felt on the ground or understood on the ground. In that environment, chaos and misinformation can spread. So I wish someone had told me the importance of just over communicating and saying things over and over and over again about the things we're doing so that there's a common nomenclature and common narrative that the community um, could, could, could work with. Well, I love, you know, in every one of your answers, there's some comment you make that I just want to get written down and, you know, put on a tattoo. I don't know. This one is change happens at the speed of trust. Honestly, I think that's something we should all remember 
that uh, without that trust, you can't make things happen. Michael, Mayor Tubbs, you are a true inspiration. I know that our team at Stanford, the students who have you know, looked to you as an inspiration, the community that watches is so um, inspired by you and what you've done in a few years uh, really sets the bar high for all of us to make really, really positive change in the world. So thank you so much. I know you have so much. Oh, I want to point out, there's an amazing HBO documentary about you. Um, I just watched it last night. It was riveting and fascinating. I highly recommend it. And I understand that it is free for the next month, free streaming. You don't even need HBO. Uh, you just go, um, do you go to the HBO site? So how do you find yeah. it? Go to the HBO go to hbo.com or you just Google stock on my mind HBO. Um, it'll come up and I, I think it's incredible that they're showing the story of the city for free for a month. So I'm thankful to them for that. Yeah, it's really, really empowering. And uh, I'm delighted that the whole world gets to see and hear about your story. So thank you so much and wishing you all the best. We are here cheering you on. Count us as part of your team. Thanks so much. I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much.